July, in the year of our Lord 1097. Count Stefan sent to Countess Adela, Swedish friend, his wife, the better and more pleasant wishes that his mind can imagine. We have made in haste to the great city Nicaea by the blessing of God. We find the Turks there to be bold fighters. The unending army of God encountered mortal conflict there with the Nicaeans for four weeks. But with God triumphing, greatest Nicaea yielded on the 13th calends of July. I tell you, my beloved, that from Nicaea we shall reach Jerusalem in five weeks, unless Antioch toward us. Farewell. All was quiet in the crusader camp when Count Stephen of Blois wrote to his wife. A few days prior, on the 1st of July in the year 1097, circumstances were very different, however. The crusader army camp at Dorylaeum had been attacked unexpectedly by the Seljuk Turks in an attempt to retaliate for the fall of the Seljuk city of Nicaea. Spirits were high as a result, as the crusader camp of an estimated 50,000 strong expected to be at their target destination of Jerusalem before summer's end. For Stephen of Blois and his fellow crusaders, the victory following Dorylaeum would soon make way for the harsh reality, however. The story of the in total eight crusades to the Middle East began on November 27 in 1095, when Pope Urban II held a fierce anti-Islamic speech in Clermont in central France. From the confines of Jerusalem and the city of Constantinople, a horrible tale has gone forth and very frequently has been brought to our ears. Namely, that a race from the kingdom of Persians, an accursed race, a race utterly alienated from God, has invaded the lands of those Christians and has depopulated them by the sword, pillage and fire. They destroyed the altars after having defiled them with their uncleanness. They circumcised the Christians and the blood of their circumcision they either spread upon the altars or pour into the vases of the baptismal font. Let therefore hatred depart from among you. Let your quarrels end, let war cease, and let all dissensions and controversies slumber. Enter upon the road to the Holy Sepulchre, rest that land from the wicked race, and subject it to yourselves. Accordingly undertake this journey for the remission of your sins, with the assurance of the imperishable glory of the Kingdom of Heaven. Jerusalem, the holy city of the Christians, was to be freed from the reign of the Muslim Seljuk Turks. The Byzantine Emperor had already asked the Pope several times for help, for he feared that the barbarians would one day soon attack Constantinople. Since 1071, the Byzantines constantly suffered losses against the Turkish troops. For many participants in the crusade, the decisive factor was that Pope Urban II promised the ultimate Roman Catholic reward, an impressive indulgence that forgave all sins and guaranteed eternal life. The Crusades, however, had more causes than just the absolution of sin. The popes, princes, counts, dukes and even farmers and the poor harbored different motives each. A major causal factor was the Christian desire to liberate Jerusalem, a holy city for both Islam and Christianity, from the Muslim occupation. Under the Seljuks, who swallowed up the Abyssinian Empire from 1017 onwards, it became increasingly difficult for Christian pilgrims to go to Jerusalem and other cities nearby. The Christian Church was in a crisis since the Schism of 1054 that divided the East and the West and was constantly at odds with the secular authority of the kings and emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. Several popes hoped that the Crusades would lead to Christian fraternization. At the very least, the Crusades led away from the internal Christian problems in Europe. The participants' motives diverged. Certainly, religious motives had an influence. The Crusades were presented to the people as a commission from God, as the cry Deus Io Vult, or God Wills It, shows us. Crucial, however, was Urban's promise made in his speech, an overall indulgence for those who would take part in the journey to Jerusalem. This appealed to many Crusaders, as many of them knew that they had done wrong, and all of them were keen to go to heaven instead of hell. Getting hold of land was also a motive for Crusaders of noble birth, as well as further expansion of power, the acquisition of social prestige, especially among nobility and the clergy, and a desire for adventure. Volunteers showed up in numbers that caught even the Pope off guard. So too the Emperor of Constantinople, Alexios Komemnos, when he found a 100,000 strong army of European princes, nobles and peasants flood his capital in November 1096. To ensure they would not overwhelm his capital, he shipped them all well supplied and with a Byzantine support army to Anatolia. 
Using the Crusader army as a convenient distraction, Alexios was able to retake Nicaea with relative ease, and the Crusader army managed to defeat the retaliating Seljuk army of Kilij Arslan, resulting in high spirits and an optimistic forecast. As Stefan of Blois noted in his letter to his wife, only Antioch stood between the Crusader army and Jerusalem. The name of the city of Antioch alone gave every educated army leader chills, however. Antioch, founded in the time of Alexander the Great, had never been taken by force. The Battle of Dorylaeum was just a taste of the massacre that would follow. The siege for Antioch started on the 10th of October in 1097 and lasted for 8 months. During that winter, torrential rains turned the surrounding lands into a pool of mud. Many died of hunger and exhaustion, and although the spring brought soft weather and a supply ship from Europe, the fall of Antioch was just as far away as the very day that they arrived. It was at this point that Count Stefan of Blois had seen enough. Many began to abandon the starving Crusader army, which had already been cut in half since its departure from Europe. For Stefan of Blois, the crusade had come to an end and he returned back to the familiarity of Europe. An early end for the crusade seemed certain, as it would be but a matter of time before the Turks' reinforcements would finally arrive to lift the siege. Led by the renowned warlord Kaburga of Mosul, an army force that easily dwarfed the weakened crusader army was expected to arrive upon the dawn of summer. With barely any food and even horses left, it appeared Antioch would remain an impenetrable city. Or so it would have been, had Antioch not been betrayed from within. A bribed guard named Ferus surrendered his tower, allowing the crusaders to scale his wall unseen and gain a foothold upon the city walls. The nearby gate was subsequently opened, allowing the rest of the army to pour through and to unleash their built-up frustration upon Antioch's populace. After eight months of waiting, the holy fighters murdered, plundered and raped their way through the streets of Antioch during the early morning. Christian flags were flown over the towers and the crusaders thanked God. But the joy of their victory was short. A mere two days later, Kaboga's troops stood in front of the city walls. Ill prepared for a siege so quickly and without any food to spare, more desertions followed. The army of 100,000 had been reduced to some 20,000. On June 28, 1097, at the crack of dawn, the crusaders carried a mass. The food scarcity was so acute that they had no choice left but to assault Kaboga's powerful army head on and to fight their way through it. Despite the odds, many crusaders were convinced God was on their side in their delirious, starving state when the gates swung open and Kaboga's mighty army stood before them. Surprisingly enough, the emaciated crusaders managed to overcome the odds. What they didn't know was that the Turkish army commanders quarreled amongst themselves and had subsequently deserted one another, ensuring the large Turkish army crumbled. The Turkish army wasn't the only one that quarreled, however. With the road to the holy city opened up before them, the remaining army leaders began to argue who would lay claim to which fief. What's more is that the crusaders faced yet another famine with the winter fast approaching. In an effort to sate their hunger, the crusader army turned to the city of Ma'arat al-Numan. 10 to 20,000 citizens were killed in the siege that followed, with some crusaders even turning to cannibalism. The troops were growing increasingly restless, threatening to march upon Jerusalem by themselves if the army leaders would not cease their quarreling. At last, the crusader army continued southward in the spring of 1099. Due to their reputation having now spread amongst the populace, they remained largely unopposed in their march to Jerusalem. Then, on the 7th of June, the day had finally come. From a hill crest, the crusaders saw the holy city with its walls, towers and domes lying at their feet. Many threw themselves to the earth and thanked God in tears that they had survived three years of hardship. After a one month siege, the crusaders made their final assault on the fortified walls on July 13th. Laying waste to the city from two sides, the crusader army proved too much for the defenders. Soon, the crusaders stormed across the wall into the streets. Yet again, they pillaged and killed as they saw fit, burning down both the Jewish synagogue and its men, women and children, and kicking down the doors of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, putting any who hit within to the sword. The total amount of casualties remains uncertain, but some historians estimate it may have been up to 60,000 people. 
Territorially, the First Crusade was a resounding success for Christianity. One of the main instigators of the crusade, Emperor Alexios, however, hardly had any reason to be satisfied. The Seljuk Empire still existed and had not been defeated, though it had been considerably weakened. In addition, Byzantium now had to deal with the four newly created crusader states, the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the principalities of Tripoli, Edessa and Antioch. The question remained whether they were to be friend or foe. For all of that, however, God's holy mission came at the price of the lives of thousands of crusaders and Muslims alike, and sowed the seeds of hatred for many more generations to come. A hatred that would only grow ever stronger in the centuries to follow. Want to learn more pixelized history? Support the channel by subscribing to it and giving this video a like. Better yet, drop a comment and let me know which subject you would like to see pixelized next. See you next time.